I'm arriving at Fabens, Texas, a small town in far west Texas where we came hoping to find calm winds and warm weather. As you'll see later on, uh, we weren't too fortunate in that regard. Famous Piper Cub, a J3. I learned to fly in one of these about 44 years ago, along with a couple of hundred thousand other pilots of that era. Hi, I'm Larry Bartlett. This tape is about the Piper Cub and other tail draggers. You know, we used to solo in these in six to eight hours. Nowadays, people think it's quite a deal to solo one in 10 or 15. We're going to talk about some of the problems of soloing a tail dragger after you've learned to fly in a, a three-wheeled airplane. These are a few examples of tail draggers that are still around. We're going to use some of these airplanes in this video today. Well, you know, one of the first things you got to learn to do with a cub is how to get in and out of it. Of course, in a J3 like this, you soloed it from the back seat. But the front seat of a Cub is kind of a trick to it. And since this tape is intended for flight instructors also, I want to tell you guys, there's one easy way to get in and out of a Cub. And you ought to see some of the ways people have devised, people have devised to do it. But the best way to do it, step on the tire, seat yourself on the uh, fuse slide, and just swing your legs in. Pull on the braces, here you are, nothing to it. I've got to admit, however, it was a lot easier 30 years ago. Boy, this brings back memories. I must have oh, a couple of thousand hours in front seat one of these things. A long time ago. This one is a real beauty and it kind of makes me want to do it again. Okay, you saw how to get in. Getting out is a little bit more difficult, but you do it in reverse. Stick your rear. Now, grab the riser, hoist your legs up, come down on the tire, there you are. Nothing to it. All it takes is practice. That's the first part, checking out the tail dragger. Well, this is a rather dainty training aid, isn't it? It's almost big enough to check out in by itself. Well, this is a conventional a model of a conventional geared airplane, and it seems rather strange today to call them conventional geared airplanes, since uh, they're in the minority. But back after World War II, before tricycle-geared airplanes became so popular, these were the conventional gear, and a tricycle was called the unconventional gear. The thing we want to talk about today is why does it take 10 to 15 hours to check out in a Cub nowadays, when back 40 years ago we were soloing in 6 to 8 hours? Well, I'll tell you, I blame Cessna for that. I blame the manufacturers, not only Cessna, but all of the manufacturers. Back in 1956, Cessna first put nose wheels on the, uh, the old Cessna 140 and the 170, and they call them the 150 and the 172. They came out with a big advertising campaign that says, now you just drive it on and drive it off. No problem. And that's exactly what people did back in the 50s and the 60s. In fact, we trained a whole generation of flight instructors to do exactly that. Drive it on and drive it off. This Cessna 150 on final right now is doing exactly what I'm talking about driving it on. Notice how he put it on all three wheels. Actually, he's got it a little bit on the nose wheel. If he's not careful, he's going to get what we call a wheelbarrow. A little bit of forward pressure, and you get it up on the nose wheel, and he'll get the scoot in one side to the other, and it's almost uncontrollable. You know, if we instructed people to fly all airplanes the same way, or to take off and land the same way, we wouldn't have any problem. But instructors, this generation of flight instructors I talked about, for a long time, we taught people to drive it on and drive it off. And if we taught people to land it on the main gear, hold the nose wheel off, maintain directional control with your feet, we wouldn't have this problem. Well, let's go on. Let's talk about one of the big differences between tail draggers and conventional three-wheeled airplanes. And that is the center of gravity location. You notice a tail dragger, the CG is behind the main gear. And what that naturally causes is a tendency for the airplane to swap in. If you land in a drift, the airplane wants to swap in. 
Now, how about this little training aid? This one happens to be a tricycle-geared airplane. I don't have enough room for the wing, but I'm sure you'll see what I'm talking about. The center of gravity on the tricycle-geared airplane is forward of the main gear. The natural tendency of this airplane, if it lands in a slight crab, is to straighten out. It's more forgiving. It's a lot more forgiving, and as a result, we've gotten sloppy. Back when I was a pilot examiner, and I'd ask for a private pilot applicant or a commercial pilot applicant for his first takeoff, I'd usually ask for a soft field takeoff. Now, you know, in a soft field takeoff in a tricycle geared airplane, you start out with the wheel all the way back, getting the maximum weight off of the nose wheel and coming in on the power. Now, as you add that power, the nose tends to go to the left naturally because of p-factor and i'm going to talk about p-factor in a minute but the nose naturally goes to the left if your reaction is to add right aileron to try to steer that airplane back on the runway then you've got a problem and you can evaluate your own proficiency this in this manner as that nose starts to the left the foot should come in if you add right aileron first you're going to have a problem with the tail dragger now, as an examiner, when an applicant did that, I knew it was going to be a long day. But if that applicant immediately corrected with right rudder as that nose started to the left, then I knew he had his technique down pat. Now, in a three-wheeled airplane, if you add aileron and so forth, as I said, it's a little bit forgiving. Tail dragger is not going to be forgiving. You apply that full power in the nose-up attitude, which is a natural takeoff attitude of the uh, tail dragger, the nose will move to the left, which is natural for the tail dragger. Let's get rid of this thing so I've got a little more room. All right. The nose and the tail dragger actually is going to move to the left because of P-factor. Now, the natural reaction, all of us learn to drive cars and so forth, is to roll that wheel to the right and try to steer that airplane back on the runway. If that is your reaction, all you're going to do if you roll the aileron to the right is lower the left aileron, raise the right aileron. On the ground, lowering the left aileron adds drag and it adds lift. But at this stage of the game, the drag is more important. By lowering that left aileron, you're just pulling that wing back more. So with the right aileron, you pull the left wing back. Aileron has no effect on the ground. The only purpose for the aileron on the ground is to keep the wings level in a crosswind. So directional control with your feet. As that nose starts to the left, right rudder to correct for that. Now, let's talk a little bit about why that nose moves to the left. Now, a lot of people say that the cause of that is torque. Well, torque is a small factor, but the big factor is P factor, propeller effect. Notice with the tail dragger in the tail low position. We have a, an angle of attack, an angle with the horizon. The down moving blade is taking a bigger bite than the blade that's coming up. As a result, we're developing more lift on the, with the down moving blade and the blade coming up. The center of thrust then is offset to the right, is offset to the right, and that tends to pull the nose of the airplane around to the left. P factor then is the biggest cause, the number one cause of what we call the left turning tendency. Now a three wheeled or nose wheel airplane does not have as much of that effect. Notice with the nose wheel airplane, the propeller is more or less or the line of thrust is parallel with the ground. We still have a left turning tendency, some left turning tendency with the nose wheel airplane, but it's caused by the slipstream effect, uh, the gyroscopic effect, and torque. P factor is the most prominent when the nose is up. I'm expecting an old friend of mine to show up in his T6. In fact, I think he's coming right now. Dr. William J. Nelson. Joe is one of the only ATP rated neurosurgeons that I've had the pleasure to meet. I certainly hope he's not going to land gear up. No, I believe he's giving us a low pass. boy, Joe. How about that sound? Isn't it great? Nothing like a radial engine. Let's see how Joe handles this touchdown with the T6. Fortunately, he's got his gear down. Good approach. Looks like a beautiful approach.
Oh, that's nice, isn't it? That is nice. Well, Dr. Nelson, this is sure a beautiful T6 you have. Thank you, Larry. How long have you had it? Oh, about five years. Well, it's great, I'll tell you. And I'm glad you brought it down here to participate with us. Thank you. You heading back for town now? Yeah, I got to go back to El Paso. I'll see you back there. You want me to help you in the airplane? Sure would be a help. Okay. <laughs> Lead off. You know, it's one thing about these old warbirds. You got all the parachutes and the harnesses and everything else you got to get into. Here comes another nose wheel airplane. Let's see what kind of a landing he makes. Looks to me like he's going to drive it on. Yeah, he did. In fact, he's driving it all over the runway. Looks like he's heading right for the camera there for a minute. There he goes. Fortunately, he's departing the scene. This beautiful 1947 Piper PA-12 supercruiser is owned by Mary Light, a flight instructor of El Paso, Texas. Her father rebuilt it from a basket case over the last four years. Her dad, Bob Gilmore, is one of the greatest gentlemen of this business and a wonderful mechanic. All right, when you're taxiing a tailwheel airplane, you always keep the stick back, all the way back, and they keep maximum pressure on the tailwheel to, to increase tailwheel steering. The only time you don't keep the stick back is if you're attacking downwind in a strong tailwind. Then you stick forward so you can lower the elevator and the wind help keep the tail down. Normally we're going to keep the stick back. As you initiate the takeoff roll, come in with full throttle simultaneously anticipate that P factor, propeller effect, a little bit of right rudder, stick back until you've got rudder control, gradually ease the stick forward to neutral, let the tail come up itself. It's not a good idea to force that tail up normally. Some airplanes, you can force the tail up before you have rudder control, and then you've got problems. So bring the stick forward slowly, let the tail come off the ground, ease the tail up, and take off in a slightly tail-low attitude. Remember, as you come up on full throttle, little right rudder, ease the stick forward to the neutral position, let the tail come up when it's ready. If you've got a crosswind, the stick into the wind. Crosswind, the stick into the wind. Otherwise, the stick is in the neutral position. Aileron's in the neutral position. I want you to notice, by the way, how you hold the stick normally. A lot of people grab it, get white knuckles. You hold the stick very lightly between the fingers and the thumb so that you can feel the airplane. An old instructor I had many years ago used to say, fly it with your fingertips and not your biceps. Hold the stick very gently between the thumb and the fingers. All right, Mary's airplane is set up now to simulate a crosswind from her right. And you notice she's got full right aileron into that crosswind, and that's what you should do at the initial stages of a crosswind takeoff. Full right aileron. The object being that you want that downwind wing to fly first. 
the downwind wing to fly first. As the airplane accelerates and approaches the takeoff airspeed, the aileron should gradually be returned to neutral. So it should come off wings level or pretty close to wings level. But, but at any rate, the downwind wing flies first. And of course, maintain directional control with your feet or the rudder. I'm using the 195 to demonstrate what I'm talking about, picking up the downwind wing. Aileron into the wind. You notice that left aileron is down, right aileron is up. And as tail comes up, you want to keep it on the ground as long as possible in a crosswind takeoff. That left wing comes up first. Landing techniques with a tail dragger are really quite similar to landing techniques with a nose wheel airplane, particularly the three-point landing. In both cases, with a nose wheel airplane, you want to put it down on the main gear and keep the wheel back. And a tail wheel airplane for a three-point landing, you hold it off, hold it off until the stall occurs, full stall, touch down all three wheels together. That's where it's called a three-point landing. The important thing to remember, the minute that airplane is on the ground, you hold that wheel all the way back to keep that tail down, maximum pressure on the tail wheel for tail wheel steering. Ailerons are neutral. You don't drive the airplane with a stick. Directional control with the rudder. Very important. You keep your eyes on the runway, straight out that windshield, until this airplane is almost stopped. Most people get in trouble by taking their eyes off the runway, relaxing the back pressure on the stick. The airplane tail comes up. You lose directional control. Uh, they try to take off the carburetor heat or readjust the trim or bring the flaps up or whatever. The point is, keep your eyes straight down the runway until this airplane is slowed almost to a stop. Remember, you're sitting right about on the pivot point in the average tail dragger. And if you're looking down in the cockpit at something and it starts to swerve, you may not feel that swerve until it's too late. And by the time you look up, it's started around. So directional control is much more critical with a tail dragger than it is with a three-wheeled airplane. Three-wheeled airplane is more forgiving, basically. You can relax the back pressure and take your eyes off the runway, and it'll swerve around a little bit. But as I said, remember, the natural tendency of a nose wheel airplane is to straighten itself out. The natural tendency of this little beast is to swap ends. Don't let it. Mary Light is slipping the airplane, now straightens out, preparatory to making a, a three-point landing. Let's watch how she does it. little gusty. Notice the wings are level. Fuselage is straight with the runway. She holds it off. Holds it off. Gets a slight bounce, but a beautiful recovery. And that little bounce, she kept that stick all the way back and came back down on the runway. Now, a lot of people, when they get a bounce like that, would relax the back pressure, and then you're in trouble, believe me. Keep that stick back. Good job, Mary. Well, look what we found out here in the West Texas skies a Pratt & Whitney powered Sturman PT-17. I believe this one is flown by my old friend Gene Dawson, owner of Gene's Flight Club in El Paso, Texas. A long time flight instructor and probably uh, the most active flight instructor in El Paso right now. I'm trying to talk Gene into landing and he agrees to do it. Fortunately, I managed to beat Gene to the ground and get out here on the runway to watch him land. And hopefully, Gene's going to demonstrate a three-point landing in a Stearman. Looks like that's what he has in mind, at least at this stage of the game. That squirrely wind, though, has given us all a little bit of trouble today. Beautiful job. Look at that. All three wheels down simultaneously, keeping the airplane straight with the rudder. Good job, Gene. Gene, there's really something about biplanes and round edges that gets old duffers like us, right? I don't know. I, I think so, because I'm sure excited about it still. Oh, Tell me, as a flight instructor in your school, do you uh, 
You teach any students in this airplane? Oh, you bet. Anybody that wants to get some time on a conventional aircraft, particularly one with history like this, you betcha I wouldn't turn them down for anything. Oh, man, that's for my own heart. Well, I guess you're about ready to head off for, for home, aren't you? Yeah, hungry, hungry, ready to go home. I'll walk you to the cockpit. How about I that? need all the help I you can get. You need all the help you can get. <laughs> Probably going to have to help you into it. Take all we can get. Well, Gene, remember, maintain directional control of your feet. Keep the blue side up and the rubber side down. Oh, oh, oh yes, sir. I hope so. We'll see Appreciate you back it. in town. We'll see you all later. Now, there's another type of landing we make with a tail dragger airplane that we don't make with a nose wheel airplane, and that's called the wheel landing. Why do we make wheel landings? Primarily because uh, you want to stay proficient in the airplane, and a proficient tail dragger pilot is proficient in both wheel landings and three-point landings. A wheel landing is a landing essentially in a level attitude, where you touch down at a slightly higher speed than the three-point, you keep the tail off the ground as long as possible with the elevator until the tail comes down by itself. Once the tail is down, full up elevator to keep it there. If you force the tail down too soon, the airplane wants to fly again. I think wheel landings are probably the best thing to make in a gusty crosswind situation. Another reason I like wheel landings is you're in control of the airplane throughout the landing procedure. There is a point in a three-point landing the full stall landing where you become a passenger in the airplane. Now there are lots of old time flight instructors and old time pilots that insist that three point landings are the only thing to ever make in a tailwheel airplane. Well, I understand what they're saying. Basically what they're saying is you should always touch down at the slowest practicable airspeed. And I agree with that in principle. But I also feel that there are many times when a wheel landing is the best thing to make. And I personally prefer wheel landings. And the reason I like wheel landings is because I've got control of the airplane throughout the landing roll. You do, you do things by the numbers, basically. You touch down in a crosswind, let's say, with, with one wheel first. If you like that, you can bring the other one down. If you at any time in the landing procedure, you can abandon it and fly again. Remember. In a three-point landing, there is a point where you become a passenger. Okay, a few points to remember about wheel landings. You should have the rate of sink at touchdown just about zeroed out, maybe carrying a little bit of power, zero out that rate of sink. If you hit coming down too fast, that tail's going to go down, you're going to be flying again. Get a good skip and a bounce. And if you ever do that, believe me, you'll never be able to catch it. Don't try to drive it back on the runway. If you get a bounce out of a wheel landing, either pull it up and you got plenty of runway left, trans transfer it back to a three-point or go around and try it again. All right, touch down, level attitude, or slightly tail low. The instant it touches down, power should be off, a little bit of forward pressure to nail it. They call it nailing the airplane. 
You bring the tail up, kill what lift it might be remaining, and you hold that tail up, maintaining directional control with the rudder, with your feet. When the tail is ready to come down by itself, then you transition to full rear elevator, hold the tail down, and let it roll out. Wheel landings are very valuable, very practical, and it's essential you know how to do a wheel landing if you want to call yourself a complete tail dragger pilot. Notice how this Super Cub pilot copes with the gusty wind and squirrely wind conditions we have here in Fabens today. This light airplane gets bounced around pretty well, but he does a good job. Puts it on the wheels. Eventually. There, he's on the ground. Maintaining directional control with the rudder and keeping the tail up as long as possible. I guess the only thing we have left to talk about on landings is crosswind landings. I recommend a wheel landing for a crosswind landing, but we'll talk about both procedures. Let's say that we have a wind coming from the right of this model, from this direction. The object is to stop any drift over the runway because this airplane should be lined up with the runway and the direction of flight should be, the flight path should be right down the runway. There are a couple of methods of correcting for that and we're not going to go into what you do on final approach because it's no different than it is for a three-wheeled airplane. But as we get close to the runway, if we're carrying a forward slip into the wind, a forward slip into the wind down to the runway, we roll the airplane out level so that at the instant of touchdown there is no drift or the fuselage is not crabbed to the runway. We stop the drift by keeping a wing down into the, into the wind. As we roll that right aileron in, in this case, to keep that right wing down, the airplane would tend to turn unless we held opposite rudder. So we're in cross control condition. And we hold it off, put it on one wheel if necessary. Hold it in that position as long as possible, allow the other one to come down, and then from that point on, it's just a normal wheel landing, keeping the aileron into the wind, the tail up as long as possible, keeping it straight with the rudder. When the tail comes down, full up elevator. With the three-point crosswind landing, there are two ways that people have taught over the years to do that. The old-fashioned way was to carry a crab into the wind. In this case, we'd be crabbed into the wind. And just before touchdown, just before the airplane stalled, we would kick the airplane straight and hope we landed with a fuselage straight. Now, as I say, lots of times you're a passenger in the last second or two, and I don't particularly like that method. It was taught for many years. Three-point landing is the same as the wheel landing. Carry that wing down into the wind, keep the fuselage straight, parallel with the runway, with the rudder, and at the instant of touchdown, you might be on one wheel and the tail wheel. Keep that wing up as long as possible. Many fine pilots that I know make beautiful crosswind landings, uh, three-point crosswind landings. I personally prefer the wheel landing. Here the 195 is being used to demonstrate a slip to a three-point landing, a short field landing. Actually, with this round engine, you have to do this to keep so you can see the runway. But before you get down, get on the ground, you level the wings, Keep that fuselage straight with the direction of flight. Wheel all the way back. Keep it all the way back until the airplane is slowed down. And don't take your eyes off that runway, believe me. PA-12 is being used here to demonstrate a slip to a three-point landing. Notice that wing is down. Good slip. Holding opposite rudder, you can see it. As we get close to the ground, we level the wings to a three-point landing. Now, I'd like to say Mary was doing this, but unfortunately I was because we botched that three-point landing and converted into a three into a wheel landing. It's now a wheel landing. Notice the rudder action being used to keep that thing straight down the runway. Well, we, of course, picked a pretty good day to do this sort of thing. Notice how the wind's kicking around, a little crosswind, a little gusty, but tailwheel airplanes can handle that without any problem. 
Well, here comes another old friend of mine, Quinn Boyd of El Paso, Texas, and his beautifully restored Lockheed 12. There are not very many Lockheed 12s around, and this is certainly a gorgeous one. Let's see what kind of a landing Quinn makes. Pretty good wheel landing, I'd say. What a beautiful airplane. Hi, Larry. Quinn Boyd, I'll tell you, it's sure great to see you. What a beautiful airplane you've got. Well, thank you. I'm glad you're here to get some videos oh, of it because well, it's something exceptional to see an airplane like this around. And not very many Lockheed 12s, I'll tell you. And I, this is a gorgeous one. That was a gorgeous landing, too. Did you know I was down here doing a tape on tail draggers and how to fly them? No, I didn't, but I'm sure fortunate you were, because now maybe I can get a copy of what mine looks like in the air. You bet you will. Landing. <laughs> I'll tell you, that was a beautiful landing. You did it like it's supposed to be done, a textbook. How's your Spartan running? My Spartan's doing great, but you know, in regard to that landing, I think that's the best landing I've ever made in this, so I was just lucky. Let's put it that way. <laughs> oh, I'll tell you, Quinn, you really got yourself an airplane this time. I, I thought when you had your Spartan, that was the epitome, but this has got to be... A double-breasted Spartan, as you said, right? Well, that's, that's about what you can describe it as. It's yeah. very similar. It's a performance. In fact, its performance figures match the Spartan exactly. Is that right? The Cruise is 200. The Spartan's the same. Its stall is 65. The Spartan's the same. How about that? <laughs> your, well, your flap and gear speeds are the same. It's just like no problem at all flying this compared to the Spartan. I remember I gave you a biennial flight review about 10 years ago on the Spartan. That's right. How about calling me on me next time? We'll do it. All right, this. <laughs> we'll go in this one next okay. time. Okay, good to see you, Thank Gwen. you, Larry. You bet. Glad to see you. A loss of directional control while landing will sometimes result in a ground loop. The results can be quite devastating, particularly in heavier tail draggers. This Cessna 195 ground looped to the right after it had slowed down to less than 20 miles an hour on the rollout probably the result of inattention, taking our eyes off the runway, or trying to drive it with aileron. Whatever, we need to avoid this type of a situation. We prop Mary's airplane up to simulate the start of a ground loop, a ground loop to the right. And I want you to notice particularly the control positions. Mary is simulating the typical reaction of the average person as that airplane starts around and skids around. She has got the stick full to the left, to try to drive it back on the runway. Notice what that's done with the ailerons. All we've done is lower that right aileron, add drag, remember my discussion about aileron drag, the only thing it'll do is pull that wing back. At this point, it's not gonna do anything to help keep the wings level. Centrifugal force is acting on the airplane. If anything, you wanna have the aileron into the swerve, full up aileron on the right, to help bring that wing down, full low aileron on the left in this case to help bring the airplane straight. Probably best to leave the ailerons in the neutral position. If you do anything with them at all, aileron into the swerve. Mary now has moved the ailerons to the correct position for this situation. You notice she's got the stick full right into the swerve. That has lowered that left aileron which adds drag out there and will tend to help straighten the airplane up. Remember, the ailerons are not very effective in a ground loop, but if you're going to use them at all, use the ailerons into the swerve and add that drag to the outside. Best probably to keep the uh, ailerons neutral. Some people advocate a burst of power, and I'm not really sure that's going to help. It might, but probably it's just going to accelerate you off the runway faster. Now, you notice Mary's got full, op full rudder opposite to the swerve, and that's where it should be. In this case, full left rudder, 
full right aileron, the stick all the way back to keep that tail on the ground to get as much directional control out of the tail wheel as you can. That's your best bet. I'm talking to Mary Light, the owner of this beautiful PA-12 you've seen quite a bit of in this film. Mary, how long have you had this PA-12? Well, we first flew it uh, from a total restoration job about in May of 1986, and it was a long project over four years. My father uh, restored it from a near basket case, and uh, it it has 125 hours on it now, and it, it runs like a Singer sewing machine. And we're 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 very proud of the work, and it's given me a lot of fun. Your dad, who is one of the grand gentlemen of this business has been working on this thing for years. I've been checking up on it. <laughs> That's right. I'll tell you, as a CFI, do you ever give any duel in this airplane? No, it, one thing and another, product, the uh, insurance liability problems and one thing and another, and, and of course, when you put this much work into something, you have to think twice about w wanting to subject it to student instruction. <laughs> you bet, you bet. Well, I'll tell you, it's a beautiful airplane. I owned one like this about 20 years ago. And it sure makes me homesick to see it. Well, they're a sweet flying airplane, and I'm having a lot of fun with it. That's great. Well, there you are, guys and gals. How to fly a tail dragger in five or six easy lessons. I hope you've enjoyed this tape. And for those of you that are flight instructors, I'd like to put in a plug for the National Association of Flight Instructors, NAFI. We need all the help we can get. Well, I guess I'd better crank this thing up and head for home. See you next time. You wonder what I'm doing? waking up the squirrel. Now seriously, radial engines, if they've been sitting a while, you have to pull them through at least seven or eight blades to get the oil out of these bottom cylinders. If you don't do that, you're going to get what they call a hydraulic lock. And that'll spoil your whole day. Believe me, it's not habit for me. Always check to make sure the mags are off before you do this. That would spoil your whole day, too. Well, I don't think we've got any oil in one of those bottom cylinders, so it's about ready to start. <laughs>